Dobrodošli. Ovo je Al Jazeera svijeta, ja sam Azra Hadžić. I sadržaje emisije izdvajamo. Palestinci primorani rušiti svoje kuće na okupiranoj zapadnoj obali. U protivnom, snose posljedice. Više od 500 medicinskih radnika ubijeno od početka rata u Gazi. U svakodnevne napade izloženi su velikom pritisku, teškim uvjetima i gubicima. Svoju priču dijeli pjekar iz Čikaga. Suša i inflacija pogađaju poljoprivrednike širom svijeta. U Etiopiji šestina stanovništva ovisi o pomoći u hrani, u Indiji se zatvaraju fabrike čaja. Mnoge palestinske porodice u okupiranom istočnom Jerusalemu suočavaju se s pritiscima okupacijskih vlasti koji im ne izdaju dozvole za gradnju domova. Izraelske vlasti idu i korak dalje te naređuju palestincima da sami ruše svoje objekte. Ako to ne učine, suočavaju se s visokim kaznama pa i zatvorom. Uništavanje svoga doma, ali ne s ciljem gradnje novog ili zbog lošeg stanja, već da bi se izbjegli visoke kazne koje su izraelske vlasti propisale za hiljade palestinaca koje imaju prebivalište u Jerusalemu. Ismail živi u zajemu dijelu grada koji leži na širokim granicama okupiranog istočnog Jerusalema. Ističe da svi plaćaju porez, ali da ne dobivaju usluge ili dozvole za gradnju. Prije sedam godina vlasti su srušile drugi sprat koji je sagradio za mnogobrojnu porodicu. Sada 24 člana žive u ovoj maloj kući. Some families don't get to escape the high fines and demolish their own homes. Israeli occupation authorities beat them to it, but they send the bill. Ahmed, njegov brat i dvije sestre bili su usred parnica u slučaju naredbe za rušenje, kada su se teške mašine pojavile pred njihovim domovima i sravnile ih sa zemljom. Slične su priče brojnih palestinskih porodica u okupiranom istočnom Jerusalemu. Da sami srušite svoj dom ili da platite visoku kaznu ili čak da završite u zatvoru ako niste u mogućnosti izdvojiti novac za kaznu. Ovo palestinsko naselje stješnjeno je između zida kojeg je postavio doseljenički režim i granica okupiranog istočnog Jerusalema. Gotovo da nemaju izbora. Ako se ne ocele, rizikuju da im domovi budu srušeni. Uprkos visokoj cijeni i rizicima, oni ne žele napustiti svoju zemlju. U januaru je dr. Ter Ahmed boravio u Gazi kao član tima hitne pomoći Svjetske zdravstvene organizacije. To je bilo njegovo peto putovanje u pojas, ali ništa ga nije moglo pripremiti za užase kojima je svjedočio u bolnici Al Nasser u Han Yunisu. Većina žrtava izraelskog bombardiranja bila su djeca i to su prizori koji će ga vječno proganjati. Kaže, u tri sedmice obavio sam više operacija nego u cijeloj karijeri. Od tada je prošlo gotovo sedam mjeseci, a broj ubijenih porastao je na više od 40.000. Među njima je najmanje 500 medicinskih radnika. U nastavku priča Al Jazeera Plus. One of the first nights um, a bomb very close to uh, the hospital went off and there was a building that had 12 or 15 people in it. And they brought in three young girls somewhere between the ages of 10 and 15 and all three had been killed it was clear and i remember one of them that her father had brought her in and he was begging me to do something he said please work on her work on her and he said it's just it was five minutes it's been five minutes he, he just wanted some sort of hope and uh to be able you know, i was not able to look at him and tell him that um his daughter had died somebody else had to do it for me i just couldn't do it You know, these kids have nothing to do with anything. And they're totally innocent. You look at them and they're, they don't know what's going on. They hear the bombs dropping, but they haven't processed it. They're still trying to play games. They don't realize that there's not enough food. They don't realize that there's no water available. Um, they're just looking at things through their own eyes. And you're just wondering what's going to become of them. What I struggled with the most is realizing that amidst all of this devastation, all of the trauma, all of the horrific stories, 
it's that th th these are things that are going to follow these kids for a lifetime. My name is Dr. Thayer Ahmed. I'm an emergency medicine physician in the south side of Chicago. I'm a Palestinian American. My parents came to the States in the 80s from Palestine. My wife is also a Palestinian. She was born and raised in Palestine. And I have two daughters who are Palestinian Americans. Since the war started, um, it's been hard to sit back and kind of watch what's been going on um, and not being able to do anything and feeling helpless. I was able to travel to Gaza as a part of a medical humanitarian NGO. Their name is Med Global. We joined an emergency medical team under the World Health Organization. Gaza has always been a difficult place to enter. There isn't an airport in Gaza that you can land in. And so we knew that we'd land in Cairo, and from there we'd set off and head to Rafah. Uh, Rafah is the border between Egypt and Gaza. On the way there, there are six checkpoints that try to make sure that anybody that's heading in that direction is supposed to be heading in that direction. So it's not like you can just hop in a cab and go straight for the border. The second you get close to the border, the first thing that strikes you is how many trucks of humanitarian aid are on the side. And the second we were able to get in and we went to the Palestinian side of Gaza, everything that has been going on for the last three months just hits you. There was this massive amount of people that were in Rafah. There are uh, essentially over a million people there in a city that's built for probably 250 to 300,000 people. And just walking outside and seeing how many kids were hanging around their tents. They don't even have shoes because many of them had to rush out of their houses to get there. They're walking through. Some of them are waiting in line to get some water. That's something I'm, I still struggle with because they didn't do anything to deserve this. You look at them, if you stare at them long enough, they'll smile back at you. And you know they're hungry, and you know they're cold at night, and you know that they're not going to school, they're not hanging out with their friends, they're not able to do anything that my daughter or my nieces are able to do. That eats me up. This is basically the courtyard of Ambassador Hospital in Khan Yunus. Everybody is staying right near where the hospital is. Me, myself, and a general surgeon, we were tasked with going to Khan Yunus and Nasser Hospital. And so what we heard was that Khan Yunus at the time was under a pretty intense military campaign and that they needed all the help that they could get. The first day at Nasser Hospital, right when we get off the bus and walk into the emergency department, I mean, it was shocking. The amount of people that were there, I mean, thousands of people hanging out, uh, any single, space that could be occupied by a person who was occupied either by somebody who had been displaced or a patient. This was nothing like I'd ever seen before. The hospital is totally overwhelmed. The health system has totally collapsed. And the doctors here are overworked and very tired. They work in 24-hour shifts as well as the nurses. It's a wave of patients. It's a wave of trauma patients. So the types of injuries we were seeing were pretty unique in the sense of um, these are war zone injuries in a very urban area. Khan Yunus is a very urban area. We could hear the bombs going off. And 15 minutes later, you see somebody coming in who is wounded from a bomb. And these are people who've had buildings collapse on top of them. They've had shrapnel fly everywhere and it's penetrated through their skin. It's penetrated through their skull. You see um, people who are victims of, uh, of burns, like really intense second and third degree burns. And you see a incredible amount of children who are the victims of this. There's also these drones that are there. They call them quadcopters and they've got these these uh, very large caliber, caliber bullets. They're very traumatic and we call them penetrating trauma because they go through your skin and they lodge somewhere in your body. And as a result of that, it just really tears up people's bodies. You know, I've done so many of these trauma procedures in the three weeks that I was there. I've done more so than I've done my entire career. You gotta get used to a lot of different things, right? I mean, you gotta get used to treating patients on the floor and doing procedures on the floor. These are procedures that need to be in a controlled environment. We need to make it as sterile as possible and as clean as possible for the patient. That goes out the window in Gaza just because of the sheer volume. And I'll give a small example. You know, when you have to um, make a cut or make an incision, 
Typically here we have a scalpel. In Gaza we were using razor blades that you would use for shaving. And it took me quite a while to adapt to that. I think the hardest thing by far is the amount of kids that are being affected by this. I think that's something that was incredibly hard to deal with. And I, I haven't dealt with it. And it's not something I'm gonna be able to deal with. There was a four year old and she had essentially had her arm amputated and they were working on uh, transferring her out because she had developed an infection in her arm and she needed more specialized care, especially if she wanted to keep um, most of the, what was left of her arm. I just thought about my daughter, who's almost going to be three, and um, seeing her in that child. Um, it just could have easily been us, right? I just saw myself in them. Just a relentless bombing campaign that's taking place in Yunus now. Shortly after, a bomb goes off. And it's intense, you feel it. The building shakes a little bit, the windows shake. Even you kind of feel it go through your body, like this force goes through it, your ears close. I've never been that close to a bomb going off before. Each subsequent day, we felt like it was getting closer and closer. You could hear exchange of gunfire and you can hear tank shells. There was no indication that the hospital would be attacked. People had not started to leave. Nobody had been told to evacuate. Probably around the eighth or ninth day that we were at Nasser Hospital. In the emergency department, one of the windows was struck and broken. Um, we could hear different gunshots hitting the wall of the hospital and deciding that maybe we should be sleeping on the floor. And then as it's getting more intense, as the night is going on, maybe we should use our mattresses to cover the windows. I had heard about what happened at Shifa. It never clicked that that could happen to Nasser Hospital in Khan Yunus. It never clicked for me until, you know, it, it really started to get very, very intense. And the hospital had suddenly become surrounded. And I remember the tank shelling. You could, you, it's like you could hear every single uh, movement that the, that the bomb was making through the tank. You could hear when it was being loaded and when it was being fired and then when it struck something. And I remember right when there seemed to be like probably 10 bombs going off, the, the tanks were firing and the buildings shaking and I thought the windows were gonna break and I'm on the floor and you feel like, okay, I mean, this, is, this might be it. This is, this is where I could die. This is where I might be killed. And there's this loneliness, this helplessness. I, there's nothing you can do about it. I didn't know where to go. I didn't know where, where was safe. And thinking, this is what life has been like here for almost four months in Gaza. This is what they've been dealing with. And that night, I remember that the hospital had started to fill up with smoke from the bombs. This whole time, nobody has told us that it's time to evacuate or to leave. And by the next morning, most of the medical staff had decided to take their families to safety. Many of the people in Khan Yunus were leaving. After a intense night of bombing and fighting and clashes, family members gather outside of the morgue in the Nasa Medical Complex. I think at some point our colleagues and MedGlobal had decided, okay, it's time to pick you up from the hospital, regardless of whether this had been an approved route or if this was going to be safe for them. The complex was surrounded by Israeli tanks. There was very intense bombing and exchange of gunfire. So they came and they picked us up around the 12th day in the morning. And the following day, we would go to Al-Aqsa Hospital and work there for a few days before ultimately leaving uh, Gaza. And then I thought, um, what about the people that are not able to leave? I thought of all of the different patients who were too weak or too sick to get out of there, and they had to stay. There was this sort of understanding, I think, that there would be some doctors who were gonna stay back no matter what. I don't know how somebody can make that decision. When nothing is safe and nowhere is safe, um, to kind of essentially say, I'm okay, they're gonna kill me, but I'm not gonna desert my patients. I think Palestinian healthcare workers are one of one. They are there's nothing and no one like them. They have seen the unspeakable. They have dealt with things that would traumatize people for a lifetime. They do it with grace. They do it with intelligence. And they do it with an ingenuity, a creativeness, a relentlessness, a resilience. They're heroes in every sense of the word. I think what's happened since then 
with the war on Gaza, it has woken up a lot of people and it has made us realize a few different things as Palestinians. Most of the world um, is not going to hand anything to us. It's instilled this sort of motivation in all Palestinians that they want to make sure that that reality and that that status quo doesn't persist. And if I'm ever given an opportunity to go back, if I'm able to go back and just see these people again, I would take it in a heartbeat. The second you are able to visit and sit with any of these people, it changes you. I think it makes you a better person and it instills in you this sort of motivation to be able to help and give back and do something. Um, despite the destruction, the damage, the death, the horror, it's a special place with special people there. Dvadeset milijona Etiopljana, što je šestina populacije te države, ovisi o pomoći u hrani dok se bore sa sušom, sukobima i rastućim cijenama hrane. Mohamed Val se susreo s ljudima u južnim regijama, Sidama i Oromija, koji pokušavaju preživjeti koristeći se tradicionalnim sredstvima. Možda izgleda kao da je godinama bio farmer, ali Mintik u Gutema je tek nedavno promijenio posao. Nosač u gradu Halasa postao je farmer na obližnjim poljima. U oba slučaja život nije jednostavan. Poput Mitikua Osman Uše u susjednoj regiji Oromija, jedan je od miliona etiopljana koji se suočavaju s ekonomskim poteškoćama zbog više faktora, suše, nezaposlenosti i inflacije. Dobra vijest je, kaže, da je ove godine bilo više padavina nego ranije. Iako sretan zbog padavina, druge prepreke stoje na putu farmerima poput Osmana. Even though the rainy season here in central Oromia started two months ago, Osman is just beginning to sow his potatoes. The reason he says is because he's been unable to secure the fertilizers and the other requirements for the success of his crop. Osim gnojiva, poljoprivrednici se žali na nedostatak sjemena, ali i traktora ili barem volova koje im je država nekada osiguravala. Pokušavajući ublažiti ekonomsku krizu, vlada je s Međunarodnim monetarnim fondom dogovorila kredit o 3,4 milijarde dolara. No stručnjaci se pitaju hoće li to poboljšati situaciju. Daleko od složenosti službene politike i ekonomskih jednadžbi, put je jasan za ove poljoprivrednike na samom jugu Etiopije. Poljoprivrednici kažu kako je suština njihovog pristupa da budu samostalni koliko god mogu. A muku muče i uzgajivači poznatog indijskog čaja. Naime, u Indiji su klimatske promjene, smanjena proizvodnja i povećanje plaća doveli do zatvaranja najmanje 20 fabrika čaja u Saveznoj državi Zapadni Bengal. Zbog toga su stotine radnika iz tog sektora morale potražiti druge poslove kako bi sastavili kraj s krajem. Izvještava Minel Fernandez. Višnu Tanti očajnički pokušava da prehrani svoju petoročanu porodicu. On je jedan od više stotina radnika koji su ostali bez posla nakon što su plantaže čaja zatvorene. Podnosi zahtjev za mjesečnu pomoć od 18 dolara, koju indijska vlada isplaćuje kada plantaže prestanu sa proizvodnjom. Zbog nedovoljne količine kiše posljednjih mjeseci plantaže su suhe i prašnjave. Smanjeni prinosi uz napade štetočina i povećanje plata radnicima otežali su plantažama da ostanu u poslu. Kada je drought, 
then the pest happens. So it becomes a vicious cycle of drought, pest, spraying, pest. So, so by the time you get over that cycle, the monsoons come. And if you enter the monsoons with the pest activity still on the bushes, then the, the crops also go down. S obzirom na to da im se ne nudi previše opcija, mnogi kao tanti razbijaju kamenje na obali rijeke za nešto više od dolara dnevno. To je izuzetno naporan posao u sparnim uslovima, ali za mnoge je jedini način da nešto zarade. Plan da se pomogne nezaposlenima obustavljen je zbog neslaganje državne i centralne vlade. Atul Astana kaže da su prinosi u padu protekle četiri godine. Tvrdi da cijene čaja nisu porasli u odnosu na plate koje čine 70% troškova proizvodnje, ali sindikati vide drugu stranu. Hamare jo bagan band ho rahe hain, ye hamare local maliks log hain, jin maliko ka... Prošle godine indijski region Darjeeling u kojem se uzgaja vrhunski čaj zabilježio je najmanju proizvodnju u 50 godina. S obzirom na sve teže uslove, mnogi se plaše da će drugi po veličini svjetski proizvođač čaja i dalje se dočiti zatvaranju plantaža i gubitku radnih mjesta. Pred krajem misije priča iz Sarajeva. Na 30. jubilarnom Sarajevo film festivalu prikazan je film Aleja Snajpera Mom bratu, italijanskih reditelja Cristiane Lucie Grilli i Francesca Toscanija. Priča je to o Amelu Hođiću, dječaku ubijenom u maju 1995. u opkoljenom Sarajevu. Porodica i prijatelji u filmu svjedoče o njegovom ubijstvu. Amelov brat Džemil je 2019. Pokrenuo projekt Aleja Snajpera s ciljem prikupljanja fotografija i dokumentiranja ratnih zbivanja tokom opsade glavnog rada Bosne i Hercegovine. Džemil je imao 12 godina kad je ubijen na njegov stari brat tokom opsade Sarajeva. Igru je prekinuo snajperski hitac koji je Amela pogodio u prsa. Plač i vriska djece, majke koje ih dozivaju. Tako opisuje trenutak nakon napada. Maj 1995. kaže da će zauvijek biti urezan u njegovom sjećanju. Mi smo Amela u Natal Ude, stavili smo ga u auto i išli smo prema vojnoj bolnici. U jednom momentu Amela je počeo da krklja, zato što njemu zrak izlazi iz luča. U tom momentu ja sam mislio da je Amela živ. Ja sam sa usjećenjem mami rekao, mama, Amela je živ. Moja mama koja je medicinska sesta je znala da Amel nije živ, ona se je ugrizla za usne i rekla nije sine, to je zrak. Iz djetinstva u opkoljenom gradu nema mnogo fotografija, a to ga je potaklo da 2019. pokrene projekta Lea Snajpera. Želi pronaći, locirati i arhivirati fotografije nastale u Sarajevu od 1992. do 1996. Nisam ja jedini koji nema fotografije iz tog perioda, jer ispostavilo se u toku projekta da smo pronalazili stotine drugih fotografija i svaka reakcija, skoro svaka reakcija tih koji bi se pronašli na tim fotografijama bila bi jao, pa ovo je jedina fotografija iz tog perioda. Evo, baš juče je jedna djevojka prepoznala sebe na fotografiji. Nakon što su vidjeli projekt, Kristijana Lučija Grilli i Francesco Toscani odlučuju snimiti film Aleja Snajpera, Mom bratu. U njemu se pojavljuje i ratni fotoreporter Thomas J. Hurst, koji je zabilježio život pod opsadom. Autori kažu da je posvećen ubijenoj djeci Sarajeva. Gledatelji filma na Sarajevo film festivalu nisu krili emocije. Uzirom da se radi o dokumentarnom prikazu jedne porodične ljudske drame, ispričane na najautentičniji način kroz ljude koji su i u cijelom ovom nesretnom periodu bili žrtve, a i u porodičnom smislu. Teško je gledati ovakve filme. U Sarajevo je tokom opsade ubijeno više od 11.500 ljudi, 1.601 dijete. Ranjeno je više od 56.000 osoba. Za falnost i priznanje fotografima koji su zabilježili trenutke stradanja, samo su neki od ciljeva projekta Aleja Snajpera. Kerim Sefer, Al Jazeera, Sarajevo. 
Ovom pričom došli smo do kraja emisije. Potražite nas na web stranici i YouTube kanalu Al Jazeera Balkans. Hvala za pažnju.